Hey Tech Decide fam, welcome to another video in the series. Guess what we're doing in this video? We're looking at using the triangle method or triangle of forces to find the resultant of forces. It can even be used if you have three forces acting in a system and you want to find the magnitude and direction of any of them. So come with me, but remember, like, share and subscribe. So now we're going to go into how to use the triangle method or the triangle of forces and when to use it. And I'm assuming everybody knows what a triangle is, right? I know you know this. A figure that is bounded by three sides, as simple as I can put it. So now let's describe how we get the resultant by the triangle method. If you have two concurrent coplanar forces, now let me pause if you have no idea what these are or you just need a little refresher check my eye cards and then you can watch that video then come back to this one if two concurrent coplanar forces act on an object or a system that is in equilibrium the vectors can be drawn in a diagram so that they flow in one direction a third line drawn to connect the ends of the two vector lines would represent the resultant remember Previous video, we spoke about the vector lines. Yes, we also spoke of the vector drawing. So we are going to be starting that in this one. When we have those three lines, we would call this a triangle of forces. So once you have a vector diagram with three sides and it's a closed figure, then we have a triangle of forces. The resultant and the equilibrant can be determined by measuring the length, which we know is the magnitude, and the angle, which would give us the direction. Remember, a force is a vector quantity. It is a vector, it must have a magnitude and a direction. The triangle of forces can also be used to determine the size, sense and senses, whether it's a push or a pull, and the line of action, if three forces are acting on a system and are in equilibrium. So it's not only to find the resultant, it can also be used if you have three forces and there is an unknown, or there are two unknowns or whatever the case is but you the unknown would be like the magnitude but you got the direction right so the triangle of forces can be used so let's now get to an example so i have two forces here and they're both pulling at this point so when i say pull it's away from it so this is the point we could name this point p or whatever we choose this is the point and force A and force B are pulling at that point. Now, we are going to go to look at how we would convert this from a force line A and B to vector lines. So this, for example, would represent vector A. This is vector line A. Now, this is five, five kilonewtons and we've done one, two, three, four, five. Now, this is an example of how you would represent it if you were doing this manually. If you were doing it manually, you would represent it in this way. Now, note that the direction is the same. It's actually a parallel line that I would have drawn here. And then now we attach B. So you notice that the orientation of these forces is somewhat different in this one. Because once you're working with a triangle of forces, the two forces must flow in one direction. So you notice this one, this is going that way, that's going that way. So we had to change the order so that we could have them flowing in one direction. So now we're going to add our third one now to close our polygon. And this is our resultant. Now, key thing, always remember to put your unit. Always remember to put your scale. And for this sample, we're using a scale of one unit to one kilonewton. So let's just confirm. A was five kilonewton. So one, two, three, four, five. Remember, each of these slots represents one unit. So that is matching up with this force. And then B, one, two, three units with the three kilonewtons given this scale that we are using. So then now we could look at our resultant. What exactly is our resultant? So we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven full units. So we know that that's seven kilonewtons. But here is a little space here, and I'm going to zoom a little. 
So you realize that this space here is somewhat smaller than the space that represents one unit. So this is larger than seven. The resultant is larger than seven kilonewtons, but it is smaller than eight. So we possibly could make, if we were to just look at this diagram, we could make a guess, an estimate, and say probably 7.4, 7.5 kilonewtons would be the resultant. However, we like to do things a little bit more accurate than just to guess. So we would take a ruler and we would measure the length and that would represent our magnitude. Our direction, we would measure the angle, right? between these two points and then we would state the angle of the resultant which would be the direction so now just a key thing and i'll keep this throughout all the videos in this series just to remind you that a resultant is a force equal to two or more forces so in essence force a plus force b would be equal to force r meaning if object P that we're saying is here was being pulled in this direction by A and this direction by B, then object P would be moving in the manner of the resultant R. I hope you really got that. Now, another thing we need to look at, an equilibrant. An equilibrant. That one might be new to you. What an equilibrant is, it's a force that is equal in magnitude and line of action to the resultant. So that simply means that where I have my resultant here, this length that represents my resultant would also be the same length of my equilibrant. So the magnitude of this resultant would be equal to my equilibrant according to this description. But it acts in the opposite direction. So let's, before I even read this last sentence, look at this. We have this force going this way and then this way. I recognize that if I try to go along the resultant, the resultant is actually pointing in the same direction as A and B, and so it doesn't create that flow. The equilibrant, on the other hand, will create a flow around the polygon, in this case, a triangle, just like that. So let's go now, B to A, and then the equilibrant creates that flow around the triangle. So that's something to bear in mind. So it's, it's a force that is equal in magnitude and line of action. Remember, no line of action is representing the point through which the force is acting. So even though their directions are opposite, they're acting along the same line. So the equilibrant, it's equal in magnitude and line of action of the resultant, but it acts in the opposite direction. And the key thing to remember too, it creates a flow. So now let's look at the triangular forces for concurrent coplanar force systems. So here's this question. And this question was taken from the BMED exam. Now, again, I decided to put this entire question, not just the part that would apply to what we are doing for this one, but I decided to put the entire one so that you can see that many times you are required to provide definitions in your exam. So the first section of this exam says you are to define concurrent forces, coplanar, resultant forces, and equilibrant forces. So I'm looking in my comment section to see the answers to these questions from you, the viewers. We are gonna be working on section B together. So it says a barge is being towed by two tugboats in the direction shown in figure one. So a barge, no need to get technical with that or let that throw you off. It's really a long flat bottom boat and it's used for carrying freight on canals and rivers. It's either self-powered or it is towed by another. In this case, it's being towed by two tug boats so that's not the thing that you're to focus on we are just going to look now at what we are given so we see tugboat here 70 kilonewtons tugboat here 80 kilonewtons and we are observing the angles between the 
direction or the line of action of the force with which they are pulling the barge. The question continues to say, find graphically. Remember, we said that graphically means using a diagram rather than calculating. So it says, find graphically the single force acting on the barge. So remember now your resultant is the sum of two or more forces. In this case, we have two forces. So we are going to be adding tugboat one to tugboat two, the force that they are exerting to get that single force, which is our resultant. The direction in which the bar the barge will move so what are they asking you in essence in these questions the single force acting they want you to tell them the magnitude of the resultant the direction in which the barge will move as it said they want you to tell the direction that's what they basically want so now let's go into autocad to complete this question okay so we are in autocad and we i have pasted the question in autocad so let's go to it. So we have two forces. We're going to be representing them as a vector. We're going to be representing each of them as a vector line so that we can then move into doing our vector drawing. So again, get line. I'm going to use layer object. So get line. I'll name this one with the 70 kilonewtons. I'll name this T1 and 80 kilonewtons T2. So those are the forces and remember when we go to our vector we are going to be using common letters so i'm going to be using my angle again type 30 degrees because i'm going to do t1 first and then we are looking at 70 kilonewtons so i'm going to be using a scale of one millimeter to 10. so i'm going to be drawing this at seven and I'm going to put on my arrowhead. Okay, so as I draw the vector diagram, I just want you to bear in mind that sometimes you will hear it being referred to as a free body diagram. And what a free body diagram is, really a diagram that represents the forces as vectors without the images that were given in the question. Also, please note that the tip of my arrowheads are at the end of my line so that my vectors are not longer than they should be. Okay, so here we now have our two vectors represented just as they are there. So what I'll do, I'm going to be taking now T2, going to copy it, or I'm going to move it. And then I'm going to put it at the end of T1. Then... I'm going to be drawing a line that is going to represent, that's going to close my triangle, and that will represent my resultant. So let me put on my arrowhead. And sometimes arrowheads are placed double on the resultant, just to distinguish it. So that's the resultant. So that's my resultant. Now we're going to be measuring the angle and the length so that we can give the answer to the question. So the first one, the single force, that will be our magnitude. So I'm going to be dimensioning all sides of my triangle so that I can demonstrate that I drew them to the correct angle and length based on the information that was given. So that is T2 that we said we did to a scale of 1 to 10. And that was T1 that we also did to a scale of 1 to 10. So now let's go for our resultant. That is 12. And that too would be a scale of 1 to 10. So if you feel like you want to move this a little bit so that it represents the force there and is not confused, you can do that. So now I'm going to be reducing the size of these because they are a bit large. And I'm going to be matching properties. So whenever you're giving an angle, you have to ensure that you give it to a particular location. So I'm going to be giving this to the horizontal.
So there you have the completed triangle and I'm showing you that I drew. So I could also dimension here. If you wanted the person who is marking your paper to see that you did everything to the correct magnitude and direction, you could do this dimension, the length of T2 as well as the angle, the length of T1 as well as the angle, and then the length of your resultant as well as the angle. And that would provide a solution to the question that is asked. So the simple force acting, it's 12 kilonewtons. So let me just put in the scale. So then I'm going to be writing in my answers as well. So single force. So there you have the solution to this question. Now I could have chosen to draw it at a scale of one millimeter to one kilonewton. So now I'm quickly going to be making a copy of this drawing and then adjusting it to get it at a scale of one to one. This is just so that I can show you that answer as well and then be able to show you how I would just read off the values because the scale is one to one. But note at this point now, I am changing my precision to one decimal point and that's because on my scale drawing of one to one, I found that the magnitude of the resultant was 119. Also note that for the scale diagram of one millimeter to 10 kilonewtons, I would just simply need to multiply my measured value by 10 to get the correct answer. So in this scale, it would be easier for me to just write the magnitude because it's already at a scale of one to one. Whereas in the smaller version, it was in a scale of one to 10, so I had to multiply 11.9 times 10 and eight times 10, seven times 10. The angles, however, you do not multiply the angles. Angles are usually drawn as is. You do not draw angles to scale, only lengths. And that's a wrap. Ah, how was that one? Let me know in the chat, man. Let me know if this video was helpful and keep the comments going so that I know I am reaching you. So join me in the next one when we're looking at the parallelogram method to find the resultant of forces.